all of you are doing well. A couple of reminders. The participation for this past week is due today. Um, that's extra credit. And I'll open up a new one on the weekend and I'll just make it due on Thursday again. Your assignment three, assessing uh, your plumbing system is due today with a 72 hour, no excuse needed grace period. You don't need to email me. I will actually this evening just change the submission date, allowable submission date online Kappa to give everyone that extension. And then we'll talk about TMDL effectiveness mon monitoring today. And that is a written assignment. It's posted on Lon Kappa. And that will be the last of the assignments that you'll have for 480 for this semester. So as I mentioned, TMDL effectiveness monitoring, TMDL stands for total maximum daily load. And this is a process that was developed probably about 20 years ago. What we're looking at is trying to determine the maximum amount of a pollutant that a water body can receive without exceeding water quality standards. Prior to this, we looked at emissions to a body of water much more on a single unit level. So we looked at, for instance, a wastewater treatment plant effluent. We looked at a industrial discharge. The attempt with this was to be much more holistic and look at both point sources like the two that I just mentioned, but also non-point sources such as urban runoff or agricultural runoff. So this includes development of guidelines for implementation or strategies to meet water quality. So if, for instance, if you look at East Lansing's website, if you search TMDL, East Lansing, you'll see that they have a strategy, a program to deal with, and in their case, it's E. coli emissions into the Red Cedar River. So the goal of TMDL monitoring is to identify water quality improvements or the lack of those that result from TMDL implementation. So the idea is to regulate pollutants as I said, much more holistically. So we look at the multiple sources of pollutants and try and address or those emissions, reducing those emissions in order to provide improved water quality. So the information in this monitoring then provides this feedback. Are there approaches that we need to do? Are there, is this what we're doing working? How do we need to change? Do we need to change? how we need to change these. So, and it provides a quantitative measure of the progress towards attainment of water quality standards. So in doing this, what we're looking at is reviewing the existing data and information. We're selecting monitoring sites and the parameters to sample. We're looking at developing a study design, determining how many samples we need to collect, and developing TMDL, monitoring a monitoring plan. So you can think about this in terms of the lab we did where you were sampling, and many of you sampled in the Red Cedar River. If we were to do a, or develop a TMDL monitoring plan, and we would be looking at, are there existing data? What data could we have obtained for phosphorus, nitrogen, or phosphorus and nitrogen, data on pH, conductivity, parameters that we were measuring, or any other parameters that are available. You would then think about what monitoring sites you would consider. I essentially did that for those of you that sampled on the Red Cedar. I provided you with some, sort, some potential sites. How I came up with those sites was really based on my knowledge of that area of the Red Cedar, what was safe, what was publicly available or accessible, and spacing these out so that you're, you had some distribution. Maybe that you also would look at if you knew where an outfall was. So for instance, looking at upstream and downstream of the East Lansing Wastewater Treatment Plant effluent. 
So you might include sites there. I will talk a little bit more about estimating sample science. I'm not gonna discuss that here. The TMDL monitoring is done on a watershed approach. The idea here is that you're looking at, again, it's, as I mentioned, it's this holistic the attempt to look at water quality holistically. So you're looking at, for instance, here is the Grand River watershed. You're looking at that watershed and you're looking at how does land use, ecological resources, interconnected water bodies, how do all of those impact water quality? How do they interact with one another with the goal of improving water quality? And these are the watersheds for, as you can see, it's dissolved oxygen, mercury, sediments, nutrients, and then nitrate. There are also watersheds for E. coli and polychlorinated biphenyls. So these are water, waters that are, are deemed impaired with regard to these particular pollutants, or in the case of dissolved oxygen, it's not really a pollutant, but it is a parameter of concern in water quality. By looking at a watershed approach, we can do a much broader assessment of the pollutant sources. We can look at these interactions between upstream and downstream sources and how they impact one another. We can involve multiple stakeholders throughout the entire watershed. And then we can also integrate the TMDLs with other watershed programs. When we're looking at developing our sites, we can look, take a number, uh, one of a number of approaches. This one here is what's referred to as the pour point method. Kind of thinking about where you pour water out of a pitcher. If we think of this in terms of the Red Cedar River flowing then, so we'll look at, say that this is the Red Cedar River flowing into the Grand River. Where would we sample, where would that sampling location likely be? Grand River empties into what body of water? Empties into Lake Michigan. So if we were thinking of where does that river empty into, we would be looking at Lake Michigan and sampling at that point here. In which case we're looking at the impact of that entire watershed. So we've got the divide here, water flows that falls in this area then flows into these tributaries, into the case of the Grand River, into the Grand River and ultimately into Lake Michigan. We can also use a distributed sampling approach. You can think of essentially what we did in lab three when you were doing the nitrogen and phosphorus sampling. You sampled throughout the river, really in the case, if we wanted to do that correctly, we would have been sampling throughout without throughout the watershed. So this distributed sampling me method, again, thinking of the Red Cedar and the Grand River, we would sample the Red Cedar, we would sample Grand River, maybe Sycamore Creek, we would sample the Looking Glass River, we'd be sampling all these rivers and creeks that flow that are tributaries of the Grand River to get a better picked picture of the quality of water in those watershed in that those bodies of water within the watershed. So when we're looking at sites, I mentioned a some of this before, you're looking at sites where TMDL implementation is expected to have discernible water quality effects. So for example, the East Lansing Water Treatment Plant has just done very significant process modifications. They have replaced their chlorine disinfection with UV disinfection, and I believe they've done some additional modifications there. They've constructed a new outfall. So one question that one would ask is, what impact do those changes have on water quality within the red cedar. So we want to sample upstream and downstream to see if there's an effect. 
if there are illicit discharges and we were able to identify those and discontinue those, you want to look at, does that have a impact? We want to look at non-point source and how we manage those sources. So for instance, do we have buffer strips? Do we, are we putting in rain gardens? What are we doing in terms of dealing with non-point sources? Are we making changes? And if we are, what impact do they have? It could also be, for instance, there's a significant amount of new development that has been happening predominantly on the eastern side of, um, southeastern side of East Lansing and into Okemos. One could ask, when you do that, you are increasing the amount of impervious area. And then how does that impact water quality? If there are stream channel restoration projects, again, looking at that, there may be areas where still have significant on-site wastewater treatment, so septic systems, perhaps those were improved or perhaps those smaller communities were put on sanitary sewer. So the question is, what impact has that those or have those measures made on water quality. In terms of the parameters, it really depends on what you're looking at. So these are actually the parameters for the TMDL for E. coli in the red cedar. So they look at total nitrogen and phosphorus because of the concern for primary productivity but also bacteria growth, total suspended solids. Partially the thought is that as that increases and you get surface water or runoff, then runoff of bacteria and E. coli is what's measured. And we could also look at dissolved oxygen, conductivity, pH, temperature, turbidity. So notice in terms of what you monitored in lab three, we looked at total phosphorus, total nitrogen, conductivity, pH, and temperature. It's actually, we were able to monitor a significant percentage of the parameters that are typically me measured for, in this case, a TMDL for E. coli. We'll also look at stressor and response variables. So what, and temperature really is, could be a stressor. Looking at what other information can you get about the condition of the water body? And then covariates, what other parameters may be related or it may impact water quality? Stream flow is a common one. Another one is precipitation. This is from the TMDL for E. coli and portions of the Red Cedar and the Grand River watersheds. And what you see here is a plot of E. coli per 100 mLs, and the way we assess bacteria is in what's referred to as colony forming units per volume of water that is analyzed. So in this case, it's 100 mLs. And it's versus time, and we're also plotting the precipitation in the 24 hours prior to when the sampling was done. So the 24 hours prior is to give time for runoff to reach for that precipitation to fall and then run off to reach the river. And precipitation is shown when the bar graphs and the line graphs are your actual data for E. coli. And what you see is a significant relationship between the E. coli levels and precipitation. These are two other graphs from the same report. And these look at the Grand River at South, on, at South Waverly in Lansing and the Grand River at MLK. And what they're looking at is the data really as a function of flow duration interval. And this is done as a percentage. But the attempt is to look at E. coli levels in terms of numbers per day, because it's based on the flow for high flow, moist conditions, medium range flows, and then dry conditions and low flows. And what you see 
is a relationship here that shows that as the flow increases in the red cedar, you see a significant increase and notice this is a log scale. We're looking at, if we look from here to these values here, about a hundred fold increase in the level of E. coli in these bodies of water. You see a similar relationship here and the Grand River. Also plotted on here are what are known as the total body contact levels and the partial body contact levels. So these water quality standards were promulgated under part 31 of the Water Resources Protect Protection of the Natural Resources and Environmental Protection Act, NEREPA, and they set limits. Again, for partial body contact, so they think of that as kayaking in the river, canoeing in the river, total body contact is swimming in the river. And the total body contact limit is set at 130 E. coli per 100, and that says a 30-day geometric mean, and the maximum that level is 300 E. coli per 100 ml. For partial body contact, the maximum is 1,000 E. coli per 100. So what they've done here is they've just plotted the total body contact and then the partial body contact to determine whether or not the levels are greater than or less than the total or partial body contact. And the same is here. So looking at these graphs, if you were asked to make a recommendation to the kayakers on campus at the rapids that like to kayak and flip their kayaks during high flows, what recommendation might you make to those kayakers? Yeah, I agree. Not to put your body in the, water, in the river. I, for one, am not flipping a kayak. But if I had a kayak to flip, I'm not trying to flip a kayak at those high flows because of the levels of E. coli at the higher flows. The TMDL also sets the wastewater discharge, and that waste dis water discharge cannot be more than 200 fecal coliform bacteria per 100 ml over a 30-day period or not more than 400 per 100 ml over a seven-day period. So notice it gets confusing because of the averaging that is done. These aren't instantaneous results or not, but they're actually average. So it's really important when reporting these, reporting your limits as to what the averaging actually is. So in terms of looking at study design, we can start thinking about how we would develop a study design. So let's look here at a before and after. So here, say there's significant uh, improvements that are made. We've put in this TMDL monitoring plan. We've got, we're looking at how to reduce runoff or discharges into the rivers. And we want to know whether or not that had any impact. So our control, for instance, would be before we made these changes, we monitor at the outfall where the river is discharging, the Grand River is discharging into Lake Michigan. We do some sort of treatment mitigation strategies, control measures, and then we monitor again, and we see whether or not it had an impact. If it had an impact, great, we can quantify that impact. If it didn't have an impact, then we need to go back and think about what else do we need to do. We can do temporal monitoring. So we can look at over time, we can monitor that same location, for instance, and look at the trends in what's happening. In terms of determining the sample size, we use statistics to determine how many samples we need in order to demonstrate a statistically significant change. So for instance, if we want to show, and goal for instance, 
is to re reduce the average E. coli over a seven day period by a factor of 100. Well, the question is, what, how many samples do we need to take in order to accomplish that? Or if we want to see a decrease in the phosphorus level of 0.5 milligrams per liter, how many samples do we need? So we use this power analysis. I'm not going to go into any detail. You're not going to need to use this, but I want you to have a sense that we typically, what we're using is statistics in order to estimate sample size. So we're looking at the minimum detectable change. We're looking at the significance. We've talked about a 95% significance, so alpha equals 0.05. N is our sample size and the standard deviation of that particular measurement. So for instance, if our minimum detectable change, we're looking at E. coli, and in this case, it would be 30 CFUs, colony forming units, per measured per 100. And this tells us that, and this is actually per year, so this is the detectable change we're looking at it tells us that we need about 60 samples to be taken over that year. Looking at an example, say we're doing ambient mon monitoring and we, that shows that this Fox Run watershed is impaired respect to total phosphorus. So the TMDL is developed for total phosphorus. So there's lots of agri agriculture, livestock op operations in this, and then they manage the manure by applying it to the land and that manure potentially can run off into the water bodies. So we wanna measure total nitrogen and total phosphorus. As you mentioned, total suspended solids, E. coli, dissolved oxygen, because there's potentially a significant amount of organic matter. We'll measure conductivity, pH, temperature, and turbidity. And I said previously that this was for E. coli, impaired water body, this set of samples, it's actually for phosphorus impaired. In the Red Cedar and Grand River where it's E. coli, the parameter that they're measuring is E. coli. And what you can start to look at as you start collecting that data. So for instance, we can do a correlation analysis. We can determine is the total phosphorus level related to stream flow? And this is log, log, log plot, but you see here that there's a pretty significant relationship. They didn't put the R squared on the plot that I took this from, but if we had the data, we could do a regression analysis on it. We can also do a correlation matrix to look at, for instance, the relationship of chloride and conductivity. You see a very strong relationship. You see very weak relationship between chloride and total suspended solids, or total phosphorus. You see a strong relationship between total nitrogen and conductivity. And hopefully using this as a tool, it gives you some insight into the sources so that you can begin to think about what other measures need to be taken if they do in terms of remediation. You can also plot the data. And here the data is plotted as a histogram. So if we look at this plot here, what you plot it is the frequency versus the total phosphorus level. So what you see is this is just the number of samples, roughly 10 samples at a level of about 0.01. It looks like uh, 60 at a, about or six, maybe 70 at 0.025. So you can see here. Now notice the data is significantly skewed to the left. If we were to draw, change that, try and draw it. So if we attempt to draw, uh, draw a line, you'll see that it's significantly skewed and sorry about the other little lines on there. Now, because it's significantly skewed, we don't have a normal distribution. But in some cases, what you're able to do is a transformation of that data. And by transforming the data, you achieve a situation where the data is normally or more normally distributed. And you can see that here. What's done is to take the 
log of the total phosphorus level and to plot the frequency just as was done. And notice here, this is much more like a normal distribution. The reason for this is the statistical tools that we have for normal distributions are actually much more powerful than those for, that are not normally distributed. So if we can transform the data, we tend to do so so that we can use the, what we refer to as the parametric statistical tests. Those are the tests that we've used so far in class. You can also do time series plots. So in this case, this is fecal coliform data. So this would be from a wastewater treatment plant. And you can look at the fecal coliform levels per 1,000 mLs, uh, and you can plot that data. And you see, for instance, here that we have these really high levels at this point. You might want to then go back and look, what happened? Was there a process upset? Was there a significant storm event? And that meant that there was a significant amount of runoff, increased flow, decreased detention time, potentially that was the cause. You can also do box plots and these box plots are done as seasonal. So you can look at the seasonal effects and you can see from these box plots, you've got the median here and the data gives you more information or the plots give you more information about the plots. So for instance, the data that was generated, for instance, for the fireworks, project. I don't think anybody plotted the data as a box plot, but for instance, you could look at that data. You could plot the hourly data. It would then determine the median, a 25th percentile, 75th percentile, it would show you the maximum, the minimum. And for instance, you could do that for the data around 4th of July, and maybe at some other point during the summer. And you could look at that data gives you a little bit more information than just simply plotting the averages. Now, in terms of selecting the appropriate test, it really depends on what your objectives are. Study design, are the data normally distributed? And you can see here, we've got the normal distribution. So we've got a normal distribution here. We have data that's skewed either to the right or left. So that impacts. Do you have data that are outliers, how do you deal with those outliers? Do you have data that's significantly below the detection limits or above the, the quantification limits? So for instance, if you have data below the detection limits, the data should be reported not as zero because there's no such thing as zero. We can't determine whether or not there is zero any. What we can determine is that it is less than some detection limits. Kind of think of it with noise, okay? You have a whistle, a dog whistle, blow the dog whistle, dog barks and gets really upset and person you're just like, uh, you know, go on with your life. Life doesn't mean that there isn't a noise. It's just outside of the range that we can hear. Well, it's the same thing with any sort of pollutant contaminant character, water characteristic below the detection limits. It's just below the the test, you saw that with nitrogen and phosphorus, for instance. Really what we should have been reporting the data, and I didn't ask you to do this, so it's fine, but think about this as you move on. When we talk about reporting data, think about what is the lowest value that you can reasonably detect. Now, actually we typically determine those detect detection limits with statistical tests, but think about that when you're reporting that data. So it's not really zero it's below some level. And then there's above some quantification level. So if we were to look at our kits, we have some upper limit. We can really only report within that limit of our test. So the question is, if it's above that, well, how far above it? Is it our limits five? Is it 10? Is it 100? We don't really know. And the problem with that data is that really not knowing skews our analyses. Also dependent is seasonality. Are we looking at, for instance, summer versus winter and how that impacts water quality or summer versus fall? And then do we have missing data? 
and how do we deal with that missing data. Inland in Excel, if you have missing data, if you use a hatch mark N slash A, then Excel sees that as missing data and it won't analyze it as a zero. So it's a useful tool in Excel. So in terms of the types of tests you would use, so for instance, if you are comparing two independent sets of data, so you're looking at before or after some remediation, mitigation strategy, upstream, downstream. If your data is normally distributed, you use a two sample t-test. It's non-parametric, a rank sum test. If you're comparing two sets of data with matched pairs, a paired watershed, so two very similar watersheds, upstream or downstream, then you can do a paired t-test. Or if it's non-parametric, so not normally distributed, you can do, use a signed rank test. And we're not going to talk about non-parametric tests at all. If you're evaluating the relationship between one data group and time, so you're looking at changes over time, so you, for instance, you're doing trend monitoring, then you can do a linear regression. It's non-parametric, then it's a Mandel and Kendall test. If you're looking at seasonality, then you're term is the seasonal term. So you do a linear regression with a seasonal term. If it's non-parametric, there's actually a seasonal Kendall test that can be used. EPA has developed a TMDL, Effectiveness Monitoring Plan. It's called emtool.xlsm. I have downloaded it. I have put it in Excel and, sorry, in LonCapi. You won't need to use it, but if you want to download it, and just play with it, feel free to do so. It uses VBA coding to enhance the Excel uh, features. So it allows you, for instance, you could put in the data from lab three and you could create some exploratory plots. You could estimate sample size. You can even estimate the monitoring costs for a TMDL study. So any questions about this next uh, topic? The assignment that you'll do is much more of a traditional kind of, it's much more like assignment one, where essentially I give you a set of data. For the most part, what I'm asking you to do is plot the data. Okay, so I want you to look at the data and do some data analysis. And the data that I've provided for you are data for E. coli on the Red Cedar River. So you'll actually be analyzing real data from the Red Cedar River. And then the, water, the wastewater data that I've provided you is wastewater data from the East Lansing Wastewater Treatment Plant. It's data that I was provided back in 2008 or so. I decided we just, we'll use that data rather than me bothering the staff to obtain additional data. I thought that was useful any, enough. So as I mentioned, it's pretty much a straight homework assignment, and that is online CAP, and that will be done individually. I'll go back and give you some time for questions. All this material is also posted. There's two presentations and a report, and that's where, if you look at those, you'll see most of the figures are all from these two documents. And then just a reminder, so we will have one more lab after assignment four, that is the pH and conductivity of soil. You will also do some soil testing. So you'll need to uh, think about that. I have posted that lab, so you might wanna take a look at it. You will need either four mason jars or some large spaghetti sauce jars, or you can use one quart Gatorade bottles, but you will need those, preferably four of the same type to determine the soil types. And then after that, the final uh, work will be a final project. I will be working on this over the next week or so. Basically what I will do there is I will give you a set of objectives. Um, you will need to pick one. And from that, you will then design an experiment and actually implement the experiment and write a report. And we'll continue the weekly extra credit participation questions.